Good evening, everyone, and, and welcome to such a special event. We do stuff in this chamber every week, most days in term, but every now and again, something happens which is really quite special, which is treasured in the society memory. Four years ago, we had one of those events when Professor Stephen Hawking came to address the chamber. The talk proved one of his last public appearances and is something that all of us in the society hold very dear. In honour of his name and his legacy, we established the Professor Hawking Fellowship. I'd like to thank, first of all, the Phoenix Partnership for sponsoring the Professor Hawking Fellowship and to our nominee this year. The Professor Hawking Fellowship awards someone who's got profound contributions to the field of STEM and even more profound contributions to education and accessibility around STEM. I therefore can think of no better nominee than Professor Brian Cox, this year's Hawking Fellow. Professor Brian Cox was chosen by the committee for his infectious commitment to science education, for the work he's done on research, and possibly most importantly, the amount of stuff you've done to enhance and further Professor Hawking himself's legacy. With that being said, I'd like to welcome Tim Hawking to award you the fellowship. Thank you, Tim. Oh. Brian, thank you so much for coming to the Union today and for receiving the Professor Hawking Fellowship. I wanted to just go back a bit to the summer and ask you how you felt when you got the email um, giving you the award. Oh, I, I was, I can't tell you how delighted I was. And um, because, it, well, in large part, because Stephen was such a large, a big influence on me. And it, it goes back as with many people probably of my age to, to a brief history of time, and actually many people since. Um, and then you know, I was fortunate enough sort of later in life to meet him on several occasions and get to know him a bit. And um, so then to, to have this, I really think it's, it's worth saying that Stephen is one of the greatest physicists, I think, without a doubt. And that, you know, it can be overused that I can't say you're one of the greats. But I think in his case, it's absolutely clear. And so, so I think there's... So to me, there was no higher kind of honour than, than that, actually. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, I, I'm so thank you <laughs> is the best thing to say. I'm just, uh, yeah, you can probably tell I don't, I'm delighted. And the Professor Hawking Fellowship, the fellowship it was created to honour someone every year who's contributed mm -hmm. in huge ways to STEM, um, but also to the education around STEM. And that's why we chose you for the fellowship. And I think something that really sums up your commitment to that is that you spend this morning talking to school children and you talk to children aged 13 to 17 about black holes and the cosmos and physics. What's it like talking to a younger audience? Um, I think, honestly, it's, it's no different. It should be no different than talking to an older audience, actually. Um, it, you, the, you know, there, there is some... I think that we underestimate the capacity of people in general young people and older people, to, to engage with complex ideas. Because black holes, I mean, they, they are, at one level, they're quite a simple idea, although it's weird to say that a star can collapse without limit. And you go, what does that mean? <laughs> what it mean? You know, it, it, so, but, but I think it's evocative. So there's, there's a way in um, which is very powerful. It's the same with A Brief History of Time, actually. I mean, just the title, A Brief History of Time, this idea that there's a theory of gravity that we have, which is Einstein's theory in 1915, that began life as a theory of gravity. It's also a theory of space and time. It's a theory of cosmology, which is a theory of the universe on the largest scales. And it's a theory that essentially predicts that under the right conditions, uh, you, can, you can get this collapse of the gravity without limit. It's, it's, Actually, I, go, I was going to say, I, I, didn't, I brought a book with me, which is The Large Scale Structure of Space Time. It's Stephen's uh, textbook from 1974 with George Ellis. And just, this is what I said. I read this to the, to the children, to the students. And it just says, this is a textbook. But what does it say here? It says in the introduction, 
Einstein's general theory of relativity leads to two remarkable predictions about the universe. First, that the final face of massive stars is to collapse behind an event horizon to form a black hole, which will contain a singularity. And secondly, that there is a singularity in our past which constitutes, in some sense, a beginning to the universe. Right? That, that's astonishing, right? A theory of gravity. And, and those, those things, by the way, event horizon, singularity, they're part of popular culture now. Why? Well, I think it goes back to a brief history of time, really. That's why. I mean, event horizon. Why? Everybody has heard of an event horizon. The, and, and so that's what I found talking to the, to the students this morning, that they know these things, that they've heard these names. They're interested, obviously, in the idea that there's a theory of gravity that predicts an origin of the universe. Everybody's interested in the origin of the universe. So from there, once the interest there, I, I think you can, you can take it on. And um, I saw you know, in the questions, we could have gone on for about two hours with questions, brilliant questions, actually. So, yeah. so I think the key is don't underestimate 14, 15, 16-year-olds. They're, they're interested in big ideas. It was amazing to see every every child's hand up for the room at one point. It was really brilliant. I wish we could have done two hours of talking. Yeah. I think what's fascinating me throughout the day actually is how much ideas from physics have seeped into popular culture and how aware we all are of them. Is physics political, do you think, because of that? Yeah. Um, I mean, it goes, from my experience, goes back to um, one of my other great heroes, Carl Sagan, who made the series Cosmos in 1980. 1979, uh, and um, it, it's a polemical series. Um, it, it deals, the 13th episode deals with nuclear war. Right? So you might say, what's the, what, what place in an astronomy documentary, basically, does that, does that have? The, the point is, as Sagan recognised, and I firmly believe, and Stephen Hawking believed it as well, um, the, the discoveries we make about nature, the discoveries we make about our place in the universe should inform the way that we behave on, I mean, there, there's the earth, right? We've got this nice prop here, it's obviously a big plan there. Um, that, that place, uh, I could make an argument now, based on what I understand about astronomy and cosmology and biology, that this planet, which is one planet around one star amongst 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy, might be the only place where a civilization exists. And um, that's an argument you can make given what we know, a bit of observation, searching for other civilizations out there, we haven't seen any or any evidence, but also what we understand about the history of life on Earth, which is it took 3.8 billion years to go from the origin of life on that planet to a civilization. And that is a long time, <laughs> even in astronomy, it's about a third of the age of the universe it took. And so what, did it, what it required to produce us is an unbroken chain of life on that little rock, in a violent universe for a third of the age of the universe. And that, when you put it like that, it sounds like a tall order. So that's perspective. So I think the perspective that astronomy and cosmology and biology have given to us is that this place might be more valuable than anybody could possibly imagine. And that's a political statement. It becomes political when you say, OK, well, how should we behave then, given that we found out that if we destroy our civilization through deliberate acts, let's say, let's say we decide to launch our nuclear weapons, we have a capability to destroy all life on that planet, or certainly all complex life. What would we do that? Then it might be that we eliminate all conscious life in a galaxy. And I would argue that means we eliminate all meaning in a galaxy, because whatever meaning is, it exists here, and it might well exist nowhere else. So, so that, that, I think, that then this is a political statement. It's like, well, then, the, what we should really be doing is making sure that we don't do that. <laughs> right? So not, not only, you know, so, so I think that the, 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 the discoveries that we make um, not only um, make our civilization operate, right? they're, they're like the foundation of our civilization, they make our lives better. Obviously, medical science makes our lives better, communications makes our lives better, and so on, right? But also, I think there's a, there's a deeper perspective that the discoveries that we make delivers, which really should, it goes to the heart of questions about what it means to be human, 
and what is our place in the universe, what is our value in the universe. I, I always joke um, about, I, and it is a joke, right? So I say on the internet, listen, it's a joke it's, if you're a philosopher. But I always, my joke is there's only one interesting question in philosophy, right? But the question is, what does it mean to live a finite, I'll say it again, what does it mean to live a finite, fragile life in an infinite, eternal universe? Right? What does it mean? Well, actually, th that's a very complex question. It's a question that I think underlies a great deal of, I mean, you're used to the English, it, it underlies a lot of literature, it underlies a lot of music, and a lot of human uh, endeavour over, over centuries, it underlies that, that, um, that, that intellectual process. But ultimately, you need to know um, something about the physical universe in order to even begin to be able to answer that question. Um, I'm not, scientists are not going to answer that question, by the way. We need everybody to answer that question. But I think there are, certain, there, there are things that you learn from our observation of the universe that are necessary, but certainly not sufficient to answer that question. So um, that's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> no, I think it's become very clear today that without science, without physics, Everything said in that, my degree in English completely unfounded on us all. Appreciation of the universe. Yeah. I, actually, I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I, I, don't, I don't think there's a hierarchy of knowledge. But I think that what, what we need is yes, we need to understand our physical place in the universe. We need to understand how old the universe is, how many stars and galaxies there are out there. We need to understand all those things. But I think that that's, we also need to understand what it means to be human, we need to understand how we feel about our place in the universe, and those are equally important, I would say. So, so I wouldn't say that, that you start with physics and then you build everything else on top. I would say that all these different fields of human endeavour are equally valuable and equally important and necessary if we're going to answer that question, which is what it means. <laughs> right. I want to just drop back to you a bit earlier. You spoke about the value of human life and the value of us now and the importance of conservation. You obviously, you spoke at COP26, I think you spoke on this topic. Mm. Are we doing enough to tackle climate change? No. <laughs> um, uh, uh, what we know, so what, what we, we, we have models of the climate and they are models. And so what, what is a model, right? Well, well it, it represents, it's our best understanding of the way the climate works. So there is no better understanding than the climate models. Now, you, so a critic would say, well, they're not perfect, and the, the, the answer to that is no model is perfect. Right? But they represent our best understanding of the problem. And our best understanding of the problem is that if we carry on putting uh, things of CO2 and greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, then the climate will become warmer. And it will, the, the, the longer we leave it, the more difficult it is to solve the problem. Uh, plus the fact but the, 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 uh, the, the impacts are there for all to see. I mean, I've just come from Australia, and um, the, the, the political argument has shifted completely, as far as I can see, in the last couple of years. And the reason is because the impact of climate change is so vivid that, you know, fires, droughts, flooding, it's, it, the, 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 there's been, Australia's had a terrible time over the last few years. And so you can see the impact, and so the political debate has shifted completely. Um, so. The, the, the key point is that, so we know what's happening, and we know that the longer we leave it, the more difficult and expensive it becomes, and the, 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 more, the, the more human catastrophes uh, occur. So, so it's, uh, it seems to be, I, I agree, by the way, having said that, that it's not an easy thing to do to solve the problem, because we have economies that are complex things, and uh, that, that run to a large extent still on fossil fuels. So it's not, I, I would not claim that it's politically or technologically or intellectually easy, but what we've discovered, unfortunately, is that there is a big problem. And the longer we leave it, the more difficult it will be to fix. Do you think humans will outlive planet Earth at the moment? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, um, so will we outlive, the, we, we, have to, we have to leave the planet at some point, um, that's way, way in the future. But um, it's interesting, if, if you look, one, one of the arguments for the fact that we might be alone in the galaxy is that 
what if if you, if there were civilizations that had left their home world that were far ahead of us, so let's say even one million years ahead of us, right? We haven't existed as a species for a million years. <laughs> so look what we've done in in, in about a quarter. You know, our civilization has been around for what ten thousand years, twenty thousand years at most. And in that time, we've gone, we've sent a space probe out of the solar system. Right. So we, we've been pretty quick. So one of the arguments that there might be few civilizations or perhaps none in the galaxy is we don't see any. We don't see any civilization that's left its home world and, 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 and essentially written its existence across the sky. So, so maybe, that, maybe, maybe we're, we're the only one capable of doing that. And so that I do think that ultimately, we have to begin to take our first steps outwards to the stars. Because if we don't do it, then I, I think it's a reasonable assumption nobody's going to do it. So you end up with a, a what is a galaxy without a civilization? A galaxy without a civilization is, a, is, is an island of stars with no meaning at all, completely meaningless, I would say. I, I'm making a philosophical point there that if there's nothing to understand the universe, then the universe is completely pointless. So debate, <laughs> there's an essay <laughs> to write, but that's my view. So you think there's sort of an onus on us to explore the universe beyond that? Yeah, because, because I have said that, I, I, my, if I was to guess, and it's a guess, but if I was to guess, I would say if we don't do it, then nobody will. And so if you, if you just think about the implication, let's say that there is no intelligent life beyond Earth in the Milky Way galaxy. Right, just let, let's confine our argument to that. So, and let's say then that, that life gets wiped out on this planet, which it will be eventually, but let's say we do it. Obviously. Then it, it is true that, that we might be responsible for eliminating meaning forever in a galaxy of 400 billion stars. So that's, a, that's the downside. <laughs> the opposite flip side is that therefore I think we have a responsibility in some sense, given that possibility, to make sure that we, um, well, to ensure that meaning exists for as long as it possibly can in, in, in our neighborhood and actually perhaps in our galaxy. But and I'm using meaning, by the way, I don't know what it is. I don't know what the word means, except that I know that the universe means something to us, self evidently. And it has to stand for consciousness, which can't exist without us, I guess. Yeah. So consciousness, the most, the, the strangest and most remarkable phenomenon in the universe that we know of. It's a bizarre thing. I mean, I talk about tonight in the lecture. Uh, I'll talk about emergence. We're, we're beginning from beginning with Stephen's work to have this picture of space and time, where space and time emerge from a deeper theory called emergent space time. Right? What's the deeper theory? It looks like it's quantum mechanics, and so it looks like there's something about quantum entanglement which is a property of, of atoms and molecules, uh, well, atoms and particles, um, which produces space and time. Well, what's consciousness? Well, there's a description of us, which is just as a collection of atoms, right? The, you know, the hydrogen atom, the hydrogen nuclei was all this time, pretty much, in <laughs> the Big Bang. And there's carbon and oxygen and iron that was formed in long dead stars and all those things. But we're just a pattern of atoms stuck together temporarily. But it's a remarkable pattern of atoms, isn't it? Because it, we're having a conversation. I mean, it's an astonishing thing when you put it that way. So I think that is one of the, the most intriguing fundamental and answered questions. And we have no idea, by the way. And I'm not insulting any neuroscientist there, because I know my neuroscientist friends say that we have no idea how that happens. It seems almost impossible, but it happened here. But the argument is, yes, that that brings meaning to the local universe. And it may well have happened nowhere else, certainly in our galaxy, but not, certainly too strong. It may well have happened nowhere else in our galaxy. Um, so there, so what? So there you go. So that's, going back to your earlier question, I think that's a political statement, isn't it? There's some politics surely follows from that observation. <laughs> Whose politics it is, I, I'm not going to say. No, I mean, it can't <laughs> So you've just written a book, actually, and you've yeah. written on black holes. Um, why black holes? Why has that captured you? Oh, because I, I say right at the start of the book, in order to understand black holes, you have to understand all the physics. It's a wonderful way of thinking about physics, because they you need, fundamentally, I mean, so, so Stephen's initial 
con great contribution to black hole research was to calculate the temperature of the black hole. So that's thermodynamics, right? That, that's the, it harks back to the 19th century when there was still a bit debate about the existence of atoms. So thermodynamics, which came from trying to understand steam engines, was, was ultimately was one of the, 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 the areas of science that led us to understand the substructure of the world. Um, then there's, so there's thermodynamics, there's quantum mechanics, because his calculation about how, how can a black hole from which nothing escapes glow, <laughs> right? Well, that's quantum mechanics, so you need quantum mechanics. You need general relativity, which is Einstein's theory of gravity to understand what the things are in the first place. Um, so, so you have all the great branches of physics. So as a way of exploring physics at the deepest level, they're magnificent things. And, and the, the great thing, which we didn't know actually in the 70s, when Stephen began his work, is that we now know that they really exist. Because we actually have a photograph of two of them, <laughs> right? So uh, one at the centre of the Milky Way, and one at a galaxy called M87. So they're, they're radio telescope photographs. So, so we really know that these things exist. And so all those challenges, where all this physics collides, uh, are real challenges. And they're, they're what, we don't just invent, because we feel like it, new theories of space and time. We've been forced into it in this collision of all these different areas of physics. And that's why I think they're just fascinating things. You could do a whole physics degree. You could start with black holes and then go, right, <laughs> what do we need to know to understand these things? And it will be your whole undergraduate physics course. That's a brilliant area of research. Yeah. I want to end on quite a big question, a kind of fair question. Um, what's next in physics? What's the next big discovery, if you had to guess? Well, the work on black holes is really going fast now. So some of the stuff I'll talk about in the lecture is, is stuff that's been done in 2022. Actually, 2019, there was a huge revolution. I think two papers that were a massive leap forward in understanding black holes in space time. Um, so that work's ongoing. It's really interesting that it's linked fundamentally to work on quantum computers, which is a very weird thing to say, but it turns out to be true. So quantum computing is one of the fundamental frontiers in engineering, computer engineering, information science, and there's a very intimate link between the two. So that's really exciting. And the other thing, though, on a different level, I think as we speak, there's a, a rover on the surface of Mars called Perseverance that's taking samples, core samples from Mars in an ancient river delta and an ancient lake bed. And they're coming back to Earth. So that it's called a Mars sample return mission. So they're going to come back to Earth probably in about 10 or 15 years. When, when someone's built a lander to go and get, them, get the sample. That's what it's designed to do. Um, and they're going to be analysed, and we're searching for signs of life. So we're trying to answer the question, was there a second genesis in our solar system? Which is a profound question. Basically, are we alone in the universe? Right? And the, the answer in a few years' time might be no. We're not. We found evidence that there's life, there was life. Maybe still is, who knows, on Mars. And also, there's another mission called Europa Clipper, which is being built, a soil being built earlier in the year, which is going to Jupiter's ice moon Europa, which has got an ocean below the surface and is another potential home for life. So I think we're on multiple fronts. We're, we're, we're really pushing profound questions. The, 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 the space time questions are really what's the fundamental nature of reality itself? And then the life in the universe, we're beginning to try and explore that experimentally. Sounds just so interesting and a very exciting few years coming up for us in that case. Yeah. Um, I'll end there, but thank you so much, Brian, for being our to Hawking Fellow, and I'm really looking forward to a lecture later today, but thank you for coming. Thank you.